This podcast is rated E for explicit and by category of true crime contains language and descriptions of crimes not suitable for young or sensitive listeners. Far removed from the free love and peace of the late 1960s, the late 1970s were pay to play. In 1978, a body was found in rural Iowa, and she would remain Jane Doe for three decades. This week, Amy tackles a case alone. This is Unidentified Female, the story of Wilma June Nissen, and you're listening to The Cold Case Chronicles. I know your secret, I know the truth, I know your secrets and I'm telling on you. Our girl. Two simple, unassuming words that showed the love of a woman by a town who didn't even know her. In fact, for over 30 years, she was just known as Jane Doe with a headstone in the cemetery that read Unidentified Female. Now, to understand how she died, I think it's important for people to know how she lived. She was a loner. She was a fighter. But it wasn't her choice. She had to fight to stay alive from the moment she entered the world. Wilma June Nissen was born to Charles and June Nissen on October 19, 1954 in San Francisco, California. She and her sister were treated horribly. They were abused, neglected. It's interesting how society's view of child abuse has changed over the years. For instance, today, we would look at how Wilma and her sister were treated, and it would make national headline news. But in the 50s, that just wasn't the case. Now, Wilma's mom walked out on the family when she was only eight years old. This left her father to care for both of the young girls on his own. Wilma's younger sister had autism, and she couldn't speak or hear. Now, whether it was out of convenience or just pure laziness, I'm not sure, but her father didn't enroll either of the girls in school. When he would go to work, he would lock Wilma and her sister in a bedroom closet. Now, if that sounds horrible, just know it's going to get worse. Her father lost his job. They were forced out of their home, and this is when the neglect and abuse just escalated. They moved into her father's car, and Wilma would be forced to go out on the street and search for food, and she was less than 10 years old at the time. Since they no longer had a bedroom closet to be locked in, her sister would actually be closed up in the trunk of the car while this went on. Both girls were removed from her father's care in 1964, but they were separated. Because people weren't as well equipped to handle autism, her sister had been placed in an institution, and Wilma just entered the foster care system, which we know isn't perfect and definitely wasn't in the 60s. Wilma grew up in several different foster homes over the years. At the age of 10, she moved in with Marshall and Maxine Holton in Anaheim, California. She couldn't read, she couldn't write, she couldn't eat with a fork, but she picked up on things quickly, and despite her learning difficulties and her difficult life, her foster parents described her as a very polite child. They say that she was thoughtful, she was loving. Her foster mom's health unfortunately started to decline, so that forced Wilma back into the foster care system. She was transferred to four different homes for short stays before finally being placed in the home of Vincent and Alice Haas in October 1967. It's really difficult for them to remember specific details about Wilma because they fostered around 200 children over the years. But while in their care, Wilma did receive a 10th grade education, which was a big accomplishment. However, we know that having a 10th grade education leaves very little opportunities for employment. At the age of 18, Wilma left home. She married Donald Wellington in 1973, and while she was married to him, she had a child, Michael Jean Pizarro Jr., on May 10, 1974. He was either given up for adoption or taken away by child services. His assumed father was originally named Michael Jean Walker, but later changed his name to Michael Pizarro for unknown reasons. Now, according to rumors, Wilma and Pizarro 
spent time hitchhiking from California to Florida with the newborn baby. That may have led to the baby being taken away or adopted. Then on December 12, 1974, she gave birth to another son, Donald E. Wellington Jr., with her husband. She started working as an escort. Her nickname was Boots, and that came from her style of white go-go boots that she would always wear. She was arrested for prostitution six times in California between 1973 and 1975, which you're going to see later turned out to be very beneficial. In and out of relationships, she married Robert Irvin on June 21, 1977, and gave birth to a daughter, Crystal, two months later. Crystal was born at only two pounds, and that was a little bit difficult to take care of. So shortly after having Crystal, she left. Wilma just left. Now, we know this because he made several calls to foster families looking for her. Since her daughter was left behind, Irvin signed the rights away of, to her daughter, and she was adopted at the age of three. Irvin ended up operating a pornography shop, and he died in July of 2000. Wilma left the state of California in February 1978 and headed to Atlanta, Georgia, with a 54-year-old man named Charles Inman Belt. His story is really convenient for someone who was last seen with a woman who ends up dead. He said that he thought Wilma had gone back to San Diego, and he says she left his mom's apartment just days after they arrived in Georgia, with only the clothing on her back. Yet somehow, she was found over a thousand miles away. On Wednesday morning, October 4th, 1978, a telephone company employee was laying cable along Highway 182 in Rock Rapids, Iowa. About 20 feet from a gravel road and concealed by tall weeds, he saw a body lying face down. She was unrecognizable because of decomposition, and it was presumed that she had been there for several months, possibly four. Still wearing her signature calf link boots, light green denim pants and underwear, but both her pants and underwear were wrapped around her left leg indicating that she was probably sexually assaulted or in the middle of a sex act when she was killed. She was naked from the waist up. Her feet were tied together with a braided hemp rope, and investigators believe that the rope was used to drag her into the ditch from either a vehicle or a nearby area because she wasn't killed in that spot. How do they know that? Well, her arms, hands, and hair were all pulled forward in the same direction, indicating she had been pulled by the rope rather than carried there and placed down. Although the body was in an advanced state of decomp, it still told a story, a horrifying story. Her lower jaw was completely missing, and she was left with only two teeth in her skull. Now, there's no doubt she was severely beaten with something strong enough to do those injuries. They never found her remaining teeth, although they looked around the area. The autopsy showed a dislocated elbow and possible dislocation of her cervical vertebra, but they were unable to tell if that occurred before or after her death. The dislocation of her cervical vertebra is indicative of a violent act that was caused by an abrupt impact or a twist of the neck. It was likely caused by a direct force of her head against an immovable object or someone trying to break her neck. But how did she get a thousand miles away from the last known place she was seen? And who would have reason to murder her and leave her out in the middle of nowhere like trash? Answer to those questions have been solved for decades. The case had a significant effect on the residents in that town. And a Sioux Falls monument company named Family Memorials by Gibson donated a pink granite headstone after watching her story in the news. They said they knew it was important for everyone to have an identity. Her headstone just read, Unidentified Female. 20 years goes by, no answers. In that area, there weren't any missing persons matching her description. And of course, DNA wasn't a thing back then, so they just didn't know how to find out who she was. But then in 1998, the Lyon County Sheriff's Department contacted Mid-State's Organized Crime Information Center out of Springfield, Missouri. They were looking for any techniques to help them identify Jane Doe. There, they found Vicki Hartigan. 
Vicki had taken a class in facial reconstruction while obtaining her degree in criminal justice. Facial reconstruction was a relatively new tool investigators had been given, and Miss Hartigan took Wilma's facial reconstruction case as a freelance project. The Sioux City Journal reported in 2006 that it was her second and last facial reconstruction. It just became too personal for her. During the facial reconstruction, an investigator normally takes a skull, studies the victim's hair, eyes, features from photos in the case, and they use clay and other items to mold and kind of sculpt a lifelike replica of what the victim would look like. But in 1998, Wilma was still Jane Doe. There were no family trees to comb through for photo lineage characteristics. They knew nothing about her. However, the replica she made was incredible. I'll attach a photo of it to our website with a side-by-side of what Wilma actually looked like. Even though that replica was distributed and put out into the media, nobody could identify her. Speaking of media, I want to say this. The coverage for this case was above and beyond anything I've ever seen. Not only were the investigators amazing with their determination, but the press in that town kept her in the headlines this entire time. The problem is, no one around that area had been looking for her all these years. Remember, she was somewhat of a transient, and she was known to leave for long periods of time. So anyone that was missing her would be reluctant to call the police and say she was a missing person. Serial killers usually target prostitutes for that very reason, because they don't believe police are going to look as hard for them. Unfortunately, in most cases, that's true, but not in this particular case. The Green River Killer, Long Island Serial Killer, even as far back as Jack the Ripper. And men think once they pay for sex, they can kind of do whatever the hell they want to to the woman. Serial psychologist Eric Hickey researched sex workers and serial killers, saying, Being a prostitute increases your chance of being murdered by 200 times. That's insane. 200 times. Plus, it rarely gets reported. When a sex worker goes missing, it's usually noticed by someone else in the business. They don't want to contact police. That's going to just draw attention to their own illegal activity. Following the facial reconstruction, there were no tips brought in. The case began to stall. Then in 2006, a Des Moines lab technician matched a name to one of the only two fingerprints they were able to pull from her decomposed body. That arrest we talked about earlier in California proved to be the key to giving Jane Doe her identity. If she hadn't been fingerprinted during that arrest, her identity would still be a mystery. With the push of an FBI profiler on September 18, 2007, investigators made the decision to exhume Wilma's body. Just to let you know how rare it is to exhume a body, according to the Sioux City Journal, in the state of Iowa, fewer than one-tenth of one percent of remains were exhumed within a five-year period. With the advancement of DNA, at that point, they were hopeful that her remains are going to still hold some secrets that they could uncover, many more secrets than back in the late 70s. Unfortunately, they weren't able to get quite as much as they'd hoped for. Although the vault was in good condition, the wooden coffin inside had a broken lid, and that allowed a lot of water to come inside. The bag containing her remains had about 50 gallons of water inside. Although that did allow her skin and flesh to stay intact, it may have washed away some of the DNA that could have been used for testing. The investigator was asked by a Sioux City Journal about the condition of her body, and he says, I was in shock as to the state of the body. It's almost identical to the crime scene photos. The flesh is still intact, and you can actually count her toes. But as soon as the body began drying out, things started to deteriorate. They noticed the body wasn't cleaned when it was placed in the coffin. It still had dirt on the body from the ditch that she was found in. Although they won't release specific information about what they found, with the help of a New York forensic anthropologist, they did discover evidence that only the killer would know. They actually said based on the cause of death that they determined, which they also aren't releasing, there was more than one person involved in the murder. 
Lyon County Sheriffs Craig Benson and Blythe Blomendahl have poured their lives into this case. And when discussing Wilma's lifestyle to a Sioux City journalist, Blomendahl says, A crime is a crime, regardless of who the victim is, regardless of who the bad guy is. They all deserve your best effort. This will get our best effort come hell or high water. As far as I'm concerned, come hell or high water, this will get solved, period. I accept nothing less. Investigators all over the country should listen to those words and take note because that is how it should be. I was so impressed with their ability to put aside the fact that she was a sex worker and focus on her as a person and as a victim. On May 8, 2006, the Lincoln County Sheriff's Department received a really strange letter. Someone wrote in saying that they had seen Wilma's body in the ditch in 1978, but they left no contact information and no other details. It'd be extremely helpful if that person would come forward to kind of fill in some gaps. I know they probably feel like they don't want to come forward because they should have called police or they should have done something, but lay all that aside. Everybody makes mistakes in their life. You may have a key piece of the puzzle that can help with this investigation. After investigators announced there was a $10,000 reward established in February 2009, a man named John Van Gameren, who was 82 years old, of Inwood, Iowa, was arrested six months later and charged with six counts of perjury for lying to investigators when he was questioned about the murder of Wilma. He was one of the many people questioned based on where they lived within a five-mile radius around where Wilma's body was found. While under oath, he falsely denied knowing Annette Jacobson after being shown two photographs of her. We're not sure what Annette Jacobson has to do with it, but that was listed. Transporting a stripper or prostitute from Sioux Falls to his residence. Having dancers at his home on more than two occasions ever having prostitutes at his home, having his wallet stolen while he was with a prostitute, and for arranging for strippers to come to his home for a bachelor party. Now, he fought all these charges, and he fought where the venue was going to be because of all the media coverage that we talked about earlier. All the charges eventually were dropped the following year for unknown reasons. At that time, investigators claimed they had new substantial information in the investigation. That was 2009. Then, on February 17, 2016, the Lyon County Sheriff's Department received a phone call they'd waited for for over 36 years. It was simple. It was powerful. Wilma June Nissen is my mother. A friend of Wilma's daughter, Starla Patterson, had been reading an article in the Long Beach Press-Telegram and saw the name Wilma June Nissen and her remains had been identified. She'd been searching alongside with Wilma's daughter for years, and there it was, suddenly right in front of her in the paper. Wilma's daughter faxed a photo of her mother when she was 18, and she also gave a sample of DNA, which eventually proved Jane Doe was indeed Wilma Nissen they finally located a family member. Now, although her daughter didn't have a lot of time with her mom, she did have some key information that the police needed. Police believe Wilma's fate may have been at the hands of at least one other escort. In 2016, police released a photo of one of the women who was known escort and dancer, and she was known to rob other escorts. She went by the name of Sugar, and while she worked for the same escort service as Wilma, they believed that she and possibly another escort who went by the name Peaches may be responsible for Wilma's death. She was interviewed several times by investigators, but obviously she's not going to admit to the crime. Soon after Wilma's murder, Sugar fled to Canada. And it was a short stay because while she was in Canada, she stabbed someone and fled back to the United States. Her partner in crime, Peaches, has never been located or identified other than the name Peaches. She is said to be a light-skinned black female from Thunder Bay, Ontario, Canada. And she worked in Iowa and Thunder Bay, Ontario, Canada in the 70s and 80s as a sex worker. 
Investigators theorize that Wilma, Sugar, and Peaches, who worked for the same escort service in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, that went by Playgirls and Playmates, were hired to go to a party. Now, at this party, something went terribly wrong. Possibly she was murdered during a robbery by the two other women, but that doesn't explain why her pants were down and her shirt was off. That seems to be indicative of Wilma being in the process of a sex act. Police really need people to come forward who were at some of the escort parties in the summer of 1978 to place Wilma with these two other women. Wilma was a white woman with brunette hair. She always wore those signature boots, and she would have been with these other two escorts in Sioux Falls. Once police started questioning the people known to be at these parties, they became very defensive. Investigators want to make sure they know that they're not suspects. They just need information. Many of these parties were so secretive, and the men involved don't want to come forward because it would be admitting that they were there. Most of the girls were even transported across state line from South Dakota into Iowa, and they don't want to be charged with anything. I personally think that's a real bitch move. You want to be so grown, you want to pay for sex and God knows what else, but you're too much of a coward to come forward and give information that might help bring closure to so many people. Police still need your help. Wilma deserved more from life than she ever received, and she's loved by so many people who didn't even know her. The community showed up for her burial service, and they want answers. If you have any information about a sex worker named Sugar or Peaches from that area in the late 70s, or if you know any details in the murder of Wilma Nissen, who was known to live in California, Florida, Georgia, and then eventually died in Iowa please contact the Lyon County Sheriff's Department. And if you're uncomfortable talking to police about a case, then send us a message through our website or any of our social media platforms, and we'll pass it along. Wilma Jean Nissen was more than an unidentified female. She was more than a sex worker. She was indeed that town's girl. She's not just a Jane Doe anymore. She's Wilma Nissen. And we need to know what happened. Please visit our website at coldcasechronicles.com or feel free to reach out via social media, Cold Case Chronicles on Facebook and Instagram, and at Cold Case Crew on Twitter. And as always, have the day you deserve, especially if you're too much of a coward to come forward. I know your secrets and I'm telling on you